as we're moving into this bigger terrain, right, we've got to develop a really well-rounded skill set. You've got to really prepare yourself for a much different environment that are pretty high consequence, right? I mean, that really is the ultimate because you're in an environment that is so hostile. You've really got to be on top of that. I met the founders of 57 Hours, geez, it must be six years ago now, seven years, no, five or six years. And I mean, really, it was just a handful of folks back then. So it's been cool to see 57 Hours grow up. And as um, they've grown up, my business has grown with them. So it's awesome. We've run trips in Canada and Norway and Europe and uh, the lower 48 here in the United States. So it's been really fun having a, a partnership like this. So I really consider all the 57 Hours people a big uh, club and family and team. So it's been super fun. So I used to live in Colorado. That's that photo down there of me rock climbing up in Boulder Canyon. And then we spent a couple of years in France, unfortunately, right before COVID started. So that kind of wrecked our European adventure. And uh, now we're back in West Seattle where my wife is born and raised. So we're liking it here. It's a bit rainy for my taste, but they've got mountains. There's a ton of snow, which is cool. I just got back from a trip to Canada, ski touring for a week. Um, we'll talk a little bit about alpine climbing. What is it? How do you do it? How do you get into it? A little bit about gear, where to do it, things like that. So alpine climbing, why, what, and how, what skills do you need? What gear are we going to suggest you uh, have uh, in the in the gear locker before you head out? Mindset, fitness, and safer. How do we do this a little bit more safely? So that's kind of the overview of the chat. And along the way, I'll try to mention where some of these slides are. This is, you're going to see this particular formation a few times in this photo. This is called the Aigui d'Entreve. And that's literally the border of France and Italy where this person is climbing right there. So if um, he was around the side, he'd be in Italy. And as he stands right there, he's in France. So this is a, a just a dramatic feature up on the Mont Blanc Massif right above Chamonix is over to the looker's left and Cormier is down in the sunshine to the right. But I'll show a few of these photos of the Aigui d'Entreve because it's a ultra classic alpine climb and it's also super scenic. So anytime you do it, you tend to look back or forward and you think, oh my gosh, I got to get my camera out and take it. It's really cool. Alpine climbing, you probably already have a pretty good idea about what it is, but it's probably the broadest of all the climbing disciplines if you compare rock climbing, ice climbing, bouldering, mixed climbing, things like that. Alpine climbing really encompasses almost every skill we use in the mountains, which is uh, what makes it really, really fun and challenging at the same time. So there's a bunch of rock climbing involved, just pure rock climbing, just like we might do in a place like Smith Rock or the Lake District in England or down in the Calanx on the Mediterranean. Alpine climbing might just be rock climbing, typically in a bigger mountain setting. So instead of being roadside at a lower elevation, you might just be pure rock climbing way up in the mountains, somewhere like the Incredible Hulk in the Sierras would count. There's definitely some pure rock climbing up in the on the south side of the Mont Blanc in the Val Ferret, going up from Cormayeur towards Switzerland, places like that. So glacier walking and climbing often. Uh, you can see my buddy Martin here is looking out at uh, that's Sahale Peak here in the Cascades in northwest United States. So often we're walking on glaciers or climbing on glaciers. So Mount Rainier would qualify as that or a Mount Baker. Some of Mount Baker would be all on glaciers. And they might just be a casual flat glacier. I'll show you a couple photos of that, or they could be a little steeper. Sahale Peak right there. This is a midsummer photo. You can see some of the crevasses are opened up, but that makes a great ski when it's totally covered in winter. And then come summer, there are people that that's their whole objective. That little bump in the background there, Sahale Peak, which is up in the North Cascades National Park. And then I'll show you a couple slides too. A pure ice climbing, so a frozen waterfall, which is pretty neat, challenging. For my personal uh, climbing, when I started thinking about being a mountain guide, I had already climbed quite a lot and um, skied quite a lot in my lifetime, but I had never climbed in a frozen waterfall. I was in my early 30s. And I thought, well, if I'm going to do this mountain guiding thing, I better know how to do it. So I, I dove into frozen waterfall climbing. And then, of course, mixed climbing is when there's a bit of rock, a bit of ice, something like that. And I'll show you a photo of that as well. But alpine climbing is occasionally fun. I guess I should say usually fun, but there are moments in there where you're really tired, really cold, things like that. It might be rainy if you're here in the Northwest or you're up in Scotland on Ben Nevis or something, but it's, so I got to be honest with you, sometimes it's miserable and, uh, but it's almost always rewarding because it really does challenge a bunch of different skill sets, which makes it fun. 
at the same time and really rewarding after the fact if you've had to you know walk on a glacier put away your glacier stuff rock climb get it get your glacier stuff back out walk back to the tram or the trailhead or whatever just makes it kind of a fun diverse challenge so it's pretty cool so there there's the aguit on trebs again and uh, we'll just start talking about some of these foundational skills and things that you might need right you can see the on trebs there is uh you have a nice flat glacier walk right up to it and then it's almost like climbing the back of a dinosaur it's very spiky and uh, in certain places it's really really narrow it just makes for an absolutely dramatic setting that's my friend bill right there in the red jacket you it's a little bit more difficult to see his friend nate is right behind him and above him pointing nate had on a green jacket that day and uh, they were both American servicemen stationed in Europe. So they came over to Chamonix when I was living there and we've become great friends. And I've since climbed and skied with them in a few different places. It's a great partnership with those guys, really cool. Another super classic formation, there's the Matterhorn. This is looking at it from Zermatt, Switzerland. So it's just one of those iconic peaks like a Mount Rainier or the Matterhorn or the Mont Blanc or Mount Cook down in New Zealand or Ben Nevis in Scotland, places like that or the Grand Paradiso in Italy. So this is what we think about when we're talking about alpine climbing. Could be a bunch of different things. There was a period last summer when the Matterhorn was in almost entirely snow-free. People weren't even taking ice axes or crampons up there. To me, it's a little bit bittersweet because it's, you know, it's an indication of climate change, but it is representative of alpine climbing in the sense that certain days you're in short sleeves and uh, you know, you're know you humming along and it's no problem. Other days you might have goggles on the hood up and you're really cold or you know challenging conditions, something like that. So it is quite diverse. And um, you know, to everything from climbing a big peak like that to this is another ridge traverse right there where you might be going up and down, up and down all day long, depending upon the terrain in front of you. It could be pitched out rock climbing for 10 hours during that day, or it might be a bunch of everything mixed in. And uh, so the scenes and settings are really dramatic, often more dramatic than just plain old rock climbing, even though I love rock climbing. You know, you do have a, a different, way different landscape out there. And you also get way up into, you know, up in the Alpine, you see a bunch of different animals. This is an ibex and it's uh, native to uh, Western Europe and even down into, uh, I think there's a related species that's down in the Atlas Mountains in Morocco, but we don't have this animal in North America. So this is one of the first times I ever saw an ibex over in Europe, I was freaking out. And this is uh, the Nid d'Aigle, means um, eagle's nest in French, and that's up on the side of the Mont Blanc. You take a little railway, cogway railway thing up there and jump out, and these ibex were just standing there looking at me, just like I was looking at them. So. It does um, alpine climbing really gets you into some cool settings and uh, positions that you might not otherwise get just skiing or just rock climbing, something like that. I'll show you a friend. This is my buddy, Dan Callahan, who lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and he came over to Chamonix for a, a really fun 10 day trip we had. And uh, this is rock climbing on what's called the Red Pillar on the Vladier, which is on the side of the Mont Blanc, too. It's a short video, but you'll get a sense of sort of the scale and uh, what's involved in just getting over to the base of the climb. What do you think of this route, dude? It's good, huh? So you can see there, as the camera panned around, you saw big glaciers around us. We're on the side of an enormous mountain, Mont Blanc, which is almost 16,000 feet high. And uh, the last little bit there, you're looking down at the mid-station on the tram above Chamonix. So you get off at the mid-station, walk about oh, an hour and a half over to the base of here. You do a little bit of very easy scrambling, but quite exposed to get to the base. And then you're on this big dramatic rock climb. It's really a, a neat formation, very, very cool. So as we're moving into this bigger terrain, right, we've got to develop a really well-rounded skill set. So many people, most people, I would say, start out rock climbing. This is a great friend and a mentor of mine, Mark Chauvin, instructing some folks. You know, rock climbing provides a great foundation for moving into alpine climbing because you're more familiar with the rope systems, how to tie in, how to belay, how to anchor yourself. And obviously the rope is key to keeping ourselves safe in the mountains at times. You know, rock climbing, if you've come out of the climbing gym and you're just starting to rock climb at a place like Red Rock or Smith Rock or El Dorado Canyon or North Conway, New Hampshire, you know, or the Lake District or wherever, some of the low elevation crags in France and Italy and Switzerland, this will give you a bunch of these skills you're going to need when you start venturing into bigger peaks. So, you know, once you're out climbing, 
typically people will start moving from sport climbing where there's bolts and things like that into um, traditionally protected climbing. This is a mixed route. When I say mixed in rock climbing, I mean bolts and traditional gear in Vegas called Dream of the Wild Turkeys, which you can see we're way off the ground right there, which is great. It's really nice training, but it's also a little bit of a stepping stone. And we'll talk about how to progress into bigger routes. But this is a, a 12 pitch route all bolted anchors. So it's relatively easy to repel off of when you're either tired out or done, or you get to the top of the route, but it does make it a forgiving longer route to sort of ease into more commitment and things like that. But this is the way we get into alpine climbing often is rock climbing, longer rock climbs. Then you start saying to yourself, well, this would be kind of cool if we did, uh, you know, a rock climb that involves, you know, maybe walking down the backside of a peak with some snow, or you got to cross a glacier to get to it, something like that. So we start easing into it. There's my good friend, Maya, who's, uh, you know, my, my savior at 57 hours with all these presentations and whatnot. But we met in um, Chamonix last summer and uh, the whole team, 57 hours came over from Croatia. So this is a ultra classic route called the Arete de Cosmique, which is right on the top of the tram. So you can take the tram up, walk out onto a glacier and then spend a couple of hours climbing your way right back up to the top of the tram. You can get a coffee up there, a snack, whatever. And uh, you can see it was just a gorgeous day. We were all in lightweight tops, and uh, but climbing in boots. And we had to cross that glacier below Maya there. So this becomes one of these first alpine routes you might do where the glacier walk is pretty easy, things like that. And then the rock climbing is not super challenging. This is the crux. Maya's smiling. She made it look easy. She was killing it. And so as we start easing into this, if you are a rock climber, you're going to want to begin perfecting these skills with walking around with sharp stuff on your feet and using an ice axe. And there's a bunch of ways to do that. If you're lucky and you live somewhere close to the Alps or you're up in the Northwest or you're in Canada or down in New Zealand, glaciers are a little bit more accessible. If you're down in Arizona, you know, it makes it a little harder. So you might have to travel, but this is a climber training before a, a guiding course. And so you can see he's on a belay. He's got a rope. There's a buddy back out of the frame and uh, it allows him to walk down on something pretty steep and then go back out just to see how the crampons work, how they stay stuck to the snow, things like that. So it's just an easy way to, to start perfecting your steep snow climbing technique. And here's walking over to a climb in France, actually. We're just barely inside of France right there. But you can see the climbers are all roped up. This gent in the blue has just stepped over a pretty big crevasse. And now he's going to keep the rope tight as the climber behind him steps over the crevasse. And we're just starting to learn how to do glacier travel. So on a glacier, typically you're worried about falling into one of these crevasses or one of these holes out on the glacier. So we have different ways of protecting ourselves. And this is yet another skill set and rope system that you'd need to learn as soon as you start venturing onto uh, crevassed glaciers like this. So I grew up in Colorado. This is another one of the skills that I really had to start focusing on when I got into guiding and studying to be a guide. It was how to manage crevasse hazard, things like that. There's another photo. This is on Mount Shucks and years ago. You can see we've tied knots into the rope. That's another way we protect against crevasse falls. If we only have two people on the rope, those knots will often jam into the lip of the crevasse as the rope is cutting in if there's any soft snow on the glacier. So all these little techniques begin to combine and make us a little more proficient in the mountains. Here's another shot uh, way up on Mount Shuxon and that red stake right there is called a picket and I'm pounding it in. It has a cable attached. You can just barely see it's a steel cable that's curving down from the picket and up into my left hand, but you pound this in, make a little channel for the cable and then you can anchor some climbers to it. You could belay off of it. You could do a bunch of stuff. So it's a, a different protection system that we use on snow versus traditional gear and bolts that we might use on rock. So we ease into all these things. Eventually, if you're starting to get pretty comfortable on snow, you might want to try to climb a frozen waterfall. This is a pretty steep one. I wouldn't recommend this for the first day. That's my buddy, Mikey Arnold, leading that. It was a, a pretty stout one, Water Ice 5, but he made it look uh, pretty relaxed. And this is just over the border from Chamonix into Switzerland, a really beautiful valley up there. You can see he's also placed ice screws right there, and he's using two ropes for protection instead of one. So as you progress through these different disciplines within alpine climbing, you're going to have to learn a couple new ropes systems, a couple new means of protecting yourself with pickets and ice screws and things like that. And none of it is rocket science, but 
you know, it takes you a couple of days to get accustomed to how the ice screws work, evaluating ice, making sure it's solid, things like that. So, you know, it's an apprenticeship that takes a few years and hopefully you can find a mentor or you've got guides nearby. That's what sort of the idea with 57 Hours was years ago is helping people get into the outdoors, whether it was kayaking, mountain biking, fly fishing, certainly guiding, skiing, things like that, you know, is really to pair you with a certified quality, competent guide. And she can help you ease into some of these skills that are pretty high consequence, right? If Mikey falls off right there, you know, it's really easy to sprain an ankle or whatever. So that's sort of the, the gist behind 57 hours. And then once you've climbed some ice, you might even start climbing rock, but with your ice climbing gear, because there are times you've got to cross some rock to get onto ice or vice versa. The ice runs out and you've got to get over to an anchor, something like that. This is a pretty casual little climb up in Vail, Colorado. So you can see that grading system, M4, M5. I don't know what they top out these days. They top out at 15 or 16 or something like this. They get really, really hard. But you've definitely got roots around that you can ease into. And as your skill set comes up, you've got to really prepare yourself for a much different environment. It's not, that's you know, less often that we're climbing in the dark on pure rock, but it does happen. But in the Alpine, certainly some of these roots are so long, you've really got to be ready to be climbing at night. So this is my friend Bruno. A great buddy of mine lives in Basel, Switzerland. He uh, is just starting up an ice climb. We had started early. It was in Kondersteg, Switzerland. And you can see, I said, hey, you know, right as you're about to start, like, oh, the light is incredible. I got to take a photo. You know, climbing at night, how to keep yourself warm and comfortable. We'll talk about gear here in a sec. All these skills that go into alpine climbing. And lastly, there are times we're traveling on snow. If it's not firm snow, you may want some kind of flotation, right? So if you're a skier or a split boarder or a snowshoer, that can also be another skill we use occasionally, alpine climbing. This is just last week up in uh, Canada. My good buddy Nino right there is guiding behind me. And so, you know, it's not the end of the world if you're not a skier or split boarder, but if it is a skill you already possess, throw it in your back pocket because it's great. I have skied into ice climbs where you might have all your ski gear on and you throw your climbing boots in your backpack. Makes the pack a little bit heavy, but it sure is nice sliding out of a climb rather than walking down in soft snow. You know, here's another shot of a pretty stout route. I had an opportunity to climb called the Smear of Fear. It's called the Smear of Fear for a reason. It was definitely pretty nerve wracking for me. I'm not the world's strongest ice climber, but it was cool. As you acquire all this stuff, we're going to need to round out your gear closet, right? So I often joke, one of my best skills in guiding is spending other people's money. So this stuff is not cheap. You know, the really high quality stuff is still made in places like Germany, Italy, Switzerland. It does add up. I apologize for telling you to go out and spend a couple thousand euros or dollars or whatever you're spending, but uh, it, it is part of the, the sport. It makes it a little tough, a little exclusive at times too. You can see you'll need a different backpack, a little bit bigger. It's got to have a, some attachments on there to carry ice tools. You know, this, that curve tool you see right there is for climbing steeper ice, a traditional ice axe for snow might be straight shafted, a little bit lighter weight, but this backpack can carry two of those tools. That crisscrossed white cord is for some crampons. And on the inside of that, it's big enough. It can probably have a medical kit, a repair kit, some food and water, a giant puffy jacket, maybe even a bivy sack, depending on what you're doing. That's a very nice package made in the United States, super lightweight out of a fancy fabric here. I still have this pack. That photo is probably 10 years old. I still have this pack. It's going strong. But you know, you have to start adapting your gear closet a little bit if you're going to do alpine climbing to all this extra sharp, heavy, pointy stuff. And another reality of alpine climbing is this is on the, the shoulder of Mount Shuxon right there. So we probably, from the trailhead where you park, you could probably be at this spot in, let's say, five hours, four and a half, five hours. So often with these longer routes, we're going to spend the night out. So that means now you got to think about where are you going to sleep, how are you going to stay comfortable. So a, a really quality sleeping pad, a tent like this one that's relatively lightweight with a little covered area called a vestibule out front. You can throw your boots and your pack out there in the rain. This is in the Cascades here in the northwest of the United States where it does rain a lot. I'm just getting used to this. I grew up in Colorado where it doesn't rain nearly as much. So this has been a definitely a transition for me. You know, your sleeping system, how you eat, how you stay warm, all these things are absolutely essential because if you're cold and miserable, your motivation goes out the window. Everybody already knows that, whether you're hiking or just, you know, a football match or something like that. It really gets tedious if you're uncomfortable. So quality sleeping bag can be very nice depending upon where you live. If it's nice in the summer, sometimes we sleep out without a tent or a tarp over us. 
in the Cascades, that's a little more uh, difficult, but in a place like Chamonix or Colorado, something like that, where you have a pretty good weather forecast and it's a dry period, there are times where you just have a sleeping bag or even just a duvet or something and you sleep out. Those are pretty neat. I got to do that on the West Ridge of Forbidden up here this summer. It was pretty neat. You want to just start thinking about all these things. So pay attention to sales, use gear, things like that. This is uh, our Bivy site. You can see it was forecast to be really dry weather. This is the Sierras in California, kind of late summer as I remember it. My buddy, Patty Farrow right there, bivying. he's looking pretty psyched, but he had a bivy sack, you know, that red waterproof sack that you pull over your sleeping bag. And, um, you know, we're hanging our food right there. We have a very compact cook stove, things like that, and a collapsible jug over there for water that we went and filled up at a beautiful stream. And this is right below the Incredible Hulk. We went and climbed uh, the Red Dihedral, which is an unbelievable route on the Incredible Hulk. But all these considerations are really important to keep yourself comfortable, but also a bit safer too. You don't want to end up freezing and undernourished while you're out there. So here's a quick list, just some ideas. And uh, by all means, if you're out shopping and you're not sure if the boots you're looking at or whatever are appropriate for what you're thinking about doing, you can always reach me through 57 hours and you can always ask me, Hey, I was thinking about buying these boots. Do you think these are appropriate for the Alps in summer? Or I was going to do some scrambling in Colorado this coming fall. You know, what do you think? It, it is quite a gear list and it is expensive, but you want to just be thinking about this kind of stuff. There's a great book out too called alpine climbing techniques to take you higher by uh, friends of mine, Mark uh, and Kathy, who live in Chamonix now. They wrote that book. She's probably 12, 14 years ago, but it's still as relevant as ever. It really will give you a very good idea about what you need to get into alpine climbing, sort of a minimal gear list. Obviously, at first, you don't need to be ice climbing and climbing on glaciers just yet. If you want to ease into it, you can just adapt your rock climbing kit. That way, you might need some different clothing and uh, some different boots and footwear and things like that. But you can certainly get a pretty good idea like that. This is the red, that photo right there is the red dihedral on the Hulk. You can see that's my friend Patty leading that pitch. This is like the killer classic pitch right there. It's easy 510. It's not crazy hard, but definitely at you know 12,000 feet, you're around the kind of Northwest side of the mountain. So it's really cold in the morning, but this is just a stellar day. It was so fun and uh, a memorable trip. Often, you know, thinking about these skills and then thinking about our mindset, we have a much different approach when we're alpine climbing, right? This is my buddy Nino guiding last summer. This is like my favorite photo that I took all summer just because he's writing that kind of classic guide photo. He's holding the rope for a couple of people below him, but it just came out kind of cool. I really like it. But one of the senses it gives me is just how small we are in that gigantic landscape on the side of Mont Blanc there. You can see those glaciers behind him are tumbling down like right in that little spot. Oh geez, must be 300 meters each of them. And the glaciers are, you know, hundred meters thick in cer certain places there. But you can see we're very vulnerable. We're on these big mountains, things like that. So we're really trying to adjust our mindset that this is not just climbing on the roadside anymore. We need to really think about weather and timing. We need to think about our fitness how we're protecting ourselves in terms of a helmet, a waterproof jacket, things like that. And it really does take a bunch more homework and respect and humility, I think, going into the mountains when we're alpine climbing. And certainly these folks that get on big 8,000 meter peaks in Asia, I've never been to one, but uh, friends of mine have. I mean, that really is the ultimate because you're in an environment that is so hostile and so indifferent to whether or not you live or die. You've really got to be on top of that. So it does require a bit more homework when we're heading out. Here's another um, objective uh, right on the Swiss French border. That reservoir down there is a big hydro project. The reservoir is actually in Switzerland, but then the water flows out into France. So they have a cooperative arrangement for the power generation there. You can see this is a traverse of these two big pillars right behind my friend Pavel there. You come up and over one, down off the backside, up and over another one, down off that side, and then across where Pavel's giving you the thumbs up right there. Pavel's a great guy. This is how he usually looks in the field, pretty psyched and having a good time. He's just a super skilled mountain guide from Poland really nice guy and I got to be friends with him and his family they're fantastic folks but this is a classic all rock objective right there but we have boots on all day the climbing is not so hard that you would want rock shoes for most of us and it's a big long day but there's no glaciers no snow at this time of the year so this is another version of alpine climbing where it's a bit of a ridge traverse so the climbing itself is some up and then some rappelling and then some traversing and things like that you know that's a big day right there and you're sticking up way in the sky you don't want to be up there in a thunderstorm that's for sure so this really requires some planning. You leave Chamonix in the dark, usually get up there, start walking at first light, and hopefully you're back down mid-afternoon, something like that. But you're really checking the weather and paying attention and watching out for each other. We were team guiding today. Each of us had one guest. 
and we were team guiding and just had a blast on that day as well. So you can see here, that's Mono Lake in the background. If you're from California, you know where that is. It's on the backside of the Sierras, just east of Yosemite National Park. And this is one of the really great routes on the planet, the third pillar of Dana. Right below my friend Tim there is a 5.9 pitch that is just absolutely out of this world. It's probably the best 5.9 pitch I've ever climbed. And again, this is a, a different challenge because you walk up on this plateau, the Dana Plateau, and then you walk down and around to the climb. So it really requires a bit of homework and getting yourself lined up so you know where to drop off the escarpment here. That road down there is coming out of the backside of Yosemite National Park. And uh, there's a famous gas station down there where um, they were really smart. They built this gas station, refurbished it, and then got a chef in there. And there's a little restaurant in the back that has actually very, very good food. So it's definitely not like you'd find uh, at a truck stop or a petrol station or something like that. And uh, so it's a little bit of a gathering spot for climbers. It's pretty neat. You can see Tim is checking the route topo and the map right there. And we're just making sure we start down in the right spot so that we're below the right formation. We're not off route and into a really loose gully or something like that. And uh, Tim's a really capable mountain guide and, and definitely one of my best buddies and a bit of a mentor as well. Tackling these bigger objectives, this is a pretty solid 510 multi-pitch route that is a little, can be a little tricky to find the base if you're not paying attention. So, you know, you want to ease into things like that. And uh, Tim's doing his homework there. Another part of doing our homework, you know, there's so much information now in guidebooks and online. So this, uh, you can see this woman's name in the, the lower left there, Steph Abeg. She is just a prolific climber that used to be based here in the Northwest. I think she's living in Boulder, Colorado now in the United States. She just had this fantastic um, habit of taking photos of everywhere she climbed and then annotating them like this. This is the West Ridge of Forbidden, one of the 50 classic climbs in North America. Very popular climb. And you can see there, she She's made some notes just to give you a little bit of a heads up where where you might go, what's going on, and you know where you might bivy and things like this. So where you see that the word notch up there in the skyline, that's where I slept last summer. It was so cool. It was during a forest fire, kind of a period of forest fire. So my friend and I were bivied up there when I woke up in the night and I kind of looked up and I had a headlamp on. And I, at first I thought it was snowing and then I kind of snapped out of it and it was ash falling out of the sky. It was dramatic. You could see a glow coming from a fire in Canada and there's one south of us too. It was a little bit of a, a drag, but at the same time it was interesting. But I mean, just a spectacular place to bivy. It's something I'll never forget. And that's, you know, it's just an experience you might not get just plain old rock climbing, something like that. And then uh, we had gone to the summit that day and come back down to the notch. My buddy Zach only had a day and a half to do this. So we kind of hustled through the day and uh, crammed it into a day and a half rather than a three-day trip that most people do. But he's young and strong. And so I was chasing him, trying to keep up. And uh, we had a great day. And uh, since then, I've met him in Vegas. He's just a really strong climber on his own. So it makes it fun to get out with him. Um, so anyway, these guidebooks and topos online and things like that, they become an integral part of doing these bigger routes, whether it's just rock climbing or even skiing or whatever. But, you know, a bigger objective requires a lot more homework, right? Some of you who have climbed in Las Vegas might rec recognize this. There's a world famous route called Epinephrine in Vegas. It's a gigantic, um, I think it's 22 pitches. So it's quite a long day. You know, you got to hustle to finish in the daylight, but it has a complicated descent. And so search and rescue out there in Las Vegas got tired of going up there and helping people down this hillside in the dark. So they posted this sign and you see that QR code, you can scan it with your phone and then download a GPX track that you can load into your navigation app on your phone. And uh, that has cut down on the rescues up there quite a bit. But uh, this is one of these things. I have the GPX in my phone. I've never had to do the descent in the dark, thank gosh. It, you know, it's just one of these things. First time I saw this, I started laughing and I said, of course, you know, why Why didn't they do this sooner? But um, it, it is a thing. So you just want to take precautions in case something goes wrong. And of course, communication is key, right? So when you're out there communicating with your buddies while you're climbing or another party that's nearby, and if you did have a problem somewhere without cell phone coverage, these little satellite devices now are absolutely indispensable for getting out an SOS call or even just texting a loved one if you said, hey, we got a rope stuck, we're gonna be late tonight, then they know, okay, it's not an emergency necessarily, but you're going to be way overdue so they don't call search and rescue and start freaking out or whatever because it can be nerve-wracking if you're sitting at home and your buddy went to do a big route and they're three hours late or whatever. This Garmin InReach Mini has kind of been the standard. The newest iPhone, I don't know if the Droid phones do it yet, but the newest iPhone will communicate with these low Earth orbit satellites. So that I think is the wave of the future. 
And so what's going to happen is, is your iPhone, it's becoming obviously our do it all, everything. It's our music, it's our camera, but now it's our navigation app. And it sounds like it's going to become our um, sort of SOS emergency app device as well, because these low earth satellites, I'm not totally sure how much coverage they have globally, but I know that people are calling in rescues and accidents when they don't have cell coverage from iPhones at this point. So it's something to really think about because God forbid you did have an accident, you know, it can turn a broken leg into a real bummer um, if you can get a call out. But if you have a broken leg and you can't get any help, then it turns into really could be a life-threatening emergency. So having something like this, I had an in-reach mini the whole time I was in Canada last week, even though we had pretty good radio coverage and even cell phone coverage occasionally. But it's just, it's that backup plan just in case everything goes haywire. It's nice to be able to pull that out and hit the SOS button. So it's something to consider. So we've talked a little bit about gear and some skills and our mindset, you know, really respecting the Alpine and taking it seriously. You can see from some of these photos that uh, some of these routes are way out there and they involve a lot more vertical relief than just roadside cragging if we're rock climbing or skiing in the area. Fitness is a big part of this. This is my buddy Rami. He's a, become a super good friend. He lives in Cairo, Egypt. Rami had never been in snow before. And so he came to Chamonix two summers ago and said to me, Robert, I really want to learn how to alpine climb and someday I think I might climb Mount Everest. And I said, oh my gosh, well, okay, you know, how much climbing have you done? And he said, nothing. And so we got a chuckle out of it, but um, he's now been back to Chamonix three times. I've met him twice and uh, he's climbing with that Jant Pavel this winter doing some ice climbing. And uh, he's just such a motivated, psyched human. He's a fantastic guy. But this was our first week in Chamonix. He'd never had crampons on, never walked on a glacier. It was really funny the first day we're walking along and he'd pause and say, Robert, what is that black thing over there? And I said, well, Rami, that's a crevasse. And he said, oh my gosh, okay. We'd walk another hundred meters. Robert, is that a crevasse? I'd say, yes, that's a crevasse, you know. So he just, I mean, it was just like brand new landscape for him. It was so cool. But the way I met Rami is he had contacted a coach at Uphill Athlete who happens to be a buddy of mine and was talking about his objectives. And this coach said, well, you're in Cairo. You know, you could fly to Chamonix on a direct flight and meet my friend Rob. You guys go climbing for a week. And then what was really cool is that coach came over the next uh, summer and we all got to climb as a threesome. It was really fun. But Rami's just a great guy and he's training super hard in Cairo, you know, which is pancake flat, huge urban environment, but he's in there on the treadmill and lifting weights and doing all this. So, you know, for those of us who live somewhere near a hill or a mountain or anything, it really opens up possibilities. But you definitely got to address some of these greater physical challenges. Bare bones, you know, you've got to be able to walk a lot further. Then you got to be able to walk uphill for quite a long time and, uh, you know, keep up with your rock climbing, things like that. So there are ways to do it. That's a great book, Training for the New Alpinism or Training the Uphill Athlete. Those are both great books. But there's tons of info online. Physically, you know, you got to have some strength and endurance, things like that. But then you really want to start to get proficient and moving efficiently on moderate terrain. This is on the West Ridge of Forbidden, my friend Alan there. He's also a medical doctor. He's one of these Renaissance people that has got multiple degrees and all this kind of stuff. You can see he's climbing in boots there. The terrain looks pretty darn easy, right? Almost everybody probably off the couch could climb that, but it takes you seven, eight hours just to get up there. So you got to have that endurance. And then once you're there, ideally you don't carry a pair of rock shoes on this route because it's just more weight and the climbing's not so hard. And, you know, in our American system, it'd be five, six or so a couple pitches. So if you have a flexible boot like he's wearing, you might be able to pull that off. If you are going to carry shoes, then maybe you just carry the lightest weight climbing slipper you got. It'll keep your pack light, but you got to be able to move quickly on this kind of terrain that's, you know, not as hard as maybe you can climb at the rock climbing gym or uh, by the roadside, but, you know, you got to be able to move across it. There's another big ridge traverse on the French-Italian border. You can see that the climbing right there doesn't look too hard, but you got to be moving pretty quick. So there are times where we shorten the rope and we might have the rope through a couple pieces of protection or around a couple horns or something like that. So that's another skill set. One of my mentors and I wrote a book called uh, The Mountain Guide Manual that talks a little bit about these guiding techniques that everybody can use and incorporate for times like this, when the climbing is not so hard that you want to pitch it out like you might a normal rock climb, but you definitely want to rope on. You can see if Louis or I fell right there, things would get serious real quick. So we're often looping the rock around these big spikes and horns. If I don't, if I can't find one of those, I might put in a cam or there might be a bolt or a piton. You could clip the rope to there. So the likelihood of a fall is very, very low. 
But if you did fall, you definitely want a protection system somehow protecting you. These are these techniques that come over from mountain guiding and mountaineering, and they meet with rock climbing, and we just adapt them to whatever the terrain is. So this would be one of these climbs where it'd be great to do it with a mountain guide once just to see how she or he does it. And then you could ask them about, well, you know, what kind of rope might I want to use? Or how long is your rope? Or how much gear did you take on this climb? And you really start to see managing this kind of terrain. Then you can start easing into some of these bigger peaks and walk-ups. This is walking right off the top of Mont Blanc. This is the very summit of Mont Blanc. I had a fantastic woman in town in Chamonix last summer. And same with uh, my buddy Rami. This uh, woman had never rock climbed, alpine climbed anything before. She'd been around snow. She lives on the East Coast of the United States, but she'd never had crampons on and whatnot. So she was taking a gap year at university. And she said, I really want to do something cool like climb Mont Blanc. Do you think I could do it? Yeah, we started chatting about how active she is and what she does. And we came up with a plan to get acclimatized, stay a couple nights in huts and things like that. You know, we eased into it. And during those ensuing six days, we practiced some rope skills, walking in crampons, how we were going to manage the rope while we we're climbing and things like that. And sure enough, we got beautiful weather. You can see right there, it's a little bit chilly and windy, but beautiful weather. You can't quite see Chamonix. It's down and to the right, but you can see that big valley down there with the highway in it. That leads right to Geneva. And that's a, a bigger city down there called Salange. We got really lucky and ended up getting to climb Mont Blanc. So that's walking off the summit right there. But Mont Blanc, you can see it's a glaciated peak. The climbing is not so hard, but it's big. It's 15,770 feet and uh, does require a bunch of endurance, efficiency walking in crampons. And uh, there she is on the top. She was so psyched. I was psyched for her too. We had a great night after this. We walked back down to the refuge and uh, spent the night there. And uh, it's a giant refuge with a hundred bunks, a kitchen and the whole bit. So they make you food and you just sit down and relax, talk to people from all over the planet. It's really cool. That's one of these peaks that would be eh, maybe not necessarily a starter peak, but it's on the easier side of things in terms of alpine objectives. And then, you know, you move into something. This is my friend Pavel shooting down from the summit of the Matter Horn, and that's just the last meters to the top. You can see at the very top of the, the photo underneath the word moving, that's the little alpine village of Zermatt, Switzerland. So you can see your way up there. This is, I think it's uh, 4,400 meters. So, you know, way above a 14,000 foot peak. This is a big day. It's so, oh, geez, it's 4,000 feet straight up. You turn around and go right back down 4,000 feet. And there's a beautiful Swiss hut at the base of this ridge. So it's quite comfortable and nice. But here's another thing, you know, managing the rope while we're moving together. You can see I've coiled it around my body. That's that big orange bulb thing on my shoulders. And it's just another one of those skills you want to have as you head into the Alpines. How do you pick your first route, right? So now you've got some skills, you've been training. What are you going to do? Cater to your strengths. If you're a better rock climber, then maybe choose an Alpine route that's just rock climbing at first. You don't have to worry about glaciers or crossing uh, snowy slopes or anything like that. This is a, a rock route in Chamonix, but you have to walk on a glacier to get to it. So maybe that's in your wheelhouse. Maybe it's not. But pick a route that you're already comfortable with in terms of the rock climbing. Maybe it's snow and uh, scrambling or something like that. But make it a manageable grade, you know? lengthwise, difficulty-wise, things like that. Don't pick something just so far out of the realm of possibility that you get yourself into trouble. So part of that is climbing below your grade. If you're a comfortable 5'9 climber, pick a route that's got some 5'5 five five on it. So you're not really thinking about the movement and falling off. You're just moving along and managing the rope and paying attention to the weather and things. Pick a peak that's a classic. It's got a you know good topo. You've got info for it, just so you have a plenty of information so you're not going in you know sight unseen and uh, make it relatively easy to get off of or give yourself an easy out. So a super remote peak that you flew into via helicopter in the coast range in uh, Canada or Alaska, that's probably not the best first objective because what if you get out there and you decide alpine climbing is not for you? Now you're stuck on the base camp and you and your buddy are sitting there and you've got problems, you know? So think about what you're doing and uh, pick a route that's appropriate for you. You can always start doing longer rock climbing routes if you're a rock climber. Vegas, this is Red Rock, that's a climb called Ginger Cracks. Vegas is a great place to ease into alpine climbing. We joke around often that it's desert alpine just because the routes are big and the approaches and descents are complicated. There's a bit of loose rock, so it does kind of simulate alpine climbing, but you can see there all I've got, in, got on is a light windbreaker and shorts. So it's a pretty nice environment relatively. It's gorgeous. The, the rock climbing is great. This is a relatively mellow walk-up peak. And that you can see that, you know, there's some crevasses around, things like that. But this would be a great starter peak as well. Easy climbing, not too steep. 
The crevasses are obvious. Go on a nice weather day, practice your rope systems, do all that. There's another, this is really just a glacier walk, which is mainly a bit of a hill here, but mainly a flat section of glacier. And you can have a bunch of people on the rope, go on a beautiful day, go out there, walk around, see if you actually like it for starters and, uh, and just keep moving along. But ease into these routes and really keep track of what's working. If it took you 25 minutes to go out there and set up your rope for glacier travel, well, Go to the rock gym or go to the park and really practice that a couple of times so you're not taking up the whole day monkeying with the ropes and, you know, having all sorts of transition problems, things like that. You know, and then go to a place where you could do a variety of routes too. That'd be great. This is Chamonix. We're on the lower side of the valley. That's Mont Blanc in the distance. We're over on the other side of the valley where there really aren't, there's a couple tiny little glaciers left on the north side of these rocks. But for the most part, it's just uh, rock climbing. It makes it really nice. Chamonix would be a great place. The Pacific Northwest is a great place. The Sierras up in Scotland can be nice, but man, the weather gets really rugged up in Scotland and uh, the snow is often not protectable on those rocks for ice and mixed climbing. So I'm a little nervous to go to Scotland and climb with my friends uh, who work at RAB, but it might not be the best place, but you can ease into it in the Lake District, down in the Alps, places like that. It makes it pretty forgiving. There's Mount Baker in the Northwest. That's often the other side of Mount Baker, just over that right skyline is one of the easier walk-ups in the Cascade. And that's a great beginner route. It's called the Easton Glacier Route. And then on this side, you can see that left-hand skyline. That's the North Ridge of Baker. That's a little bit more involved. There's often a pitch of ice climbing, pretty easy, water ice three or alpine ice three or four. So, you know, it's a little bit more involved, but not super burly. There's another photo in the outside of Chamonix. So if rock climbing's your thing, get onto a multi-pitch rock route. This thing, I don't know, is 10 pitches long or something like that. There's some more glacier walking on um, Shuxon, looking back at uh, Mount Baker. That makes a great training ground. Some more rock climbing there. This is one of the best routes I did in Chamonix the whole time I was there. Beautiful. That's my friend Chris, making it look pretty darn easy. Chris is a superstar alpinist. He skied off an 8,000 meter peak. He's put up ice climbs in Montana, you know, first descents and things. He's just a super skilled alpine climber. He started when he was a kid, really fantastic. There's Long's Peak in uh, Colorado. I wouldn't suggest going to do that little smear of ice right there for your first route, but there's some easy snow climbing right around this zone. Makes it pretty nice. There's some mellow ice in the park too. This is Rockman National Park. That'd be a great place to train. Here's a classic ridge traverse. You can see my buddy John there is in boots. So the climbing is really, really easy, but on a climb like this, you could just focus on putting all those skills together and the, the hard part of this itinerary is only about an hour and a half long. So it really is pretty forgiving in terms of like the difficulty of climbing and commitment level. And um, one of the best things about that is it's right above Cormier, Italy. So there's John. He and I went down and got a couple pizzas right after this climb. That's pretty cool. And uh, climbing in Europe is always a special thing because you can take advantage of the huts and the restaurants and things like that. It makes it really, really nice. And there's a dessert at the Hornley Hut. If you can believe that, you're up at 3,100 meters or something like this with a warm bed and a great restaurant and things like that. But this little dessert came and I was like so impressed that I took a photo of it. But that's one of the really fun things about climbing in Europe. And all these skills come together just to keep us safer, right? I don't use the word safe because going out in the mountains, there's often some residual risk no matter how safe you play it, right? Weather, rock fall, ice fall, getting benighted, things like that. Taking just a fair and square of fall while you're leading. This is the south face of the Igui Dumidi. So all these skills practicing your technical skills, having the right mindset, doing your homework, showing up appropriately fit. All these things combine to keep us a little bit safer in the Alpine because it is a bigger commitment than just rock climbing and uh, often just skiing too. There is a little branch of skiing called ski mountaineering. In Italian, they actually say ski alpinism. They kind of marry skiing and alpine climbing, typically not on routes like this. This is just a pure rock climbing route, but pretty long, 10 pitches. The neat thing about this one is, is you rappel right to the tram. And then boom, you go back down to Chamonix. So you can be in a cafe and 45 minutes after you finish this route, it's pretty great. But um, all these skills come together and keep us safer in the mountains because it is a higher consequence environment. So big thanks to Stephanie and Maya and the whole team at 57 Hours. You can follow us at at 57 Hours app. You can certainly email us anytime you want, info at 57 hours. You can always find me that way. And we're totally happy if you're dorking out on buying boots or where should I go for a spring break? mission or whatever. I'm totally happy to, you know, brainstorm with you and uh, send some stuff around. Enjoy the heck out of it. Stay in touch. And uh, yeah, don't, don't hesitate to reach out.